right. Um, we're going to talk about some examples of the kingdom now. We're going <clears> to <throat> pretty much stay in the Gospels. We'll be looking at, at a lot of scriptures. <clears throat> um, so, um, <clears throat> you may want to uh, write some of these down. First, I'm going to just start with uh, <clears throat> some questions and then give you some scriptural answers. First question is, what is the common message of the four writers of the gospel? And uh, if you'll turn to Matthew 5. <clears throat> And um, the answer, you know, the, the answer of the common message preached by the writers of the four Gospels is that they preach the kingdom. They preach the kingdom. In verse 3, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> All right. Also, um, I just want to establish this stuff. So go to Mark chapter 4, Mark 4, or you can write these down, <clears throat> Mark 4, verse 11, <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking, and he said unto his, his disciples, he said unto them, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto those who are outside, all these things are done in parables. <clears throat> All right, and so also Luke now, chapter 8, we want to see that this is the basic theme that, uh, that runs across all of these Gospels, 8-1, Luke chapter 8 and verse 1, and it came to pass afterwards that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. <clears throat> and then finally, John chapter 3. John 3 and verse 3. <clears throat> and also verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the first, verse 3 is, you cannot see the kingdom. <clears throat> verse 5 is, you cannot enter the kingdom. And um, so clearly, the Lord's wanting them to know that there's another kind of kingdom. But he's also wanting them to enter that kingdom. All right. The next question, <clears throat> what point in time were they saying it would come? <clears throat> and if you go back again to Matthew, because we're going to be bouncing through these guys. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. <clears throat> and that is, <clears throat> at what point in time were they saying the, that the kingdom would come? They were saying the kingdom was at hand. All right? All right, so Matthew 3, 2, uh, and this is John the Baptist saying this and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Also in uh, 4, verse 17, <clears throat> same book, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So <clears throat> the first scripture we gave in chapter 3 was John the Baptist saying this. And in chapter 4, it's Jesus. And um, let's see, Mark 1, 14 through 15 says the same thing. But let's go to Matthew 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 7. Matthew 10, verse 7. <clears throat> I guess we should do 5, 6, and 7. The, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, 
and in any city of the Samaritans enter not, but go rather to the sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <coughs> All right. So um, there's an emphasis, whether it's John the Baptist or Jesus or the 12 disciples or whoever, <coughs> they're not only preaching the kingdom, but they're preaching that it's at hand. Why would I even take the time to say that? Because <clears throat> a whole lot of people are talking about the kingdom coming one day, you know. <clears throat> they talk about Jesus as the soon coming king. <clears throat> all right, well, Jesus is Lord of all now. Amen? The Lord of all now. And um, we don't have to wait for him to come in the skies for the kingdom to come. We do have for, we need for him to come in us, and that's what uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again, or you're not going to see the kingdom, much less enter into that kingdom. <coughs> All right. But we can say that the kingdom is at hand. <coughs> I'm so sorry for my throat. Because the living demonstration of the kingdom was at hand, and that was Jesus. He was the living demonstration of what it would be like to be ruled by God. Okay. In the Gospels, the kingdom rule that was soon to come into our lives was already at hand in and as his life, which was pres presently being demonstrated before them. The Gospels are telling of the way of this Jesus and the life that they received. See it in him first so that you may know the him that you are presently a part of, meaning the kingdom, the, the him of the kingdom, the kingdom, the king, see the kingdom of it, not just a teaching about the kingdom without the rule of Christ and specifically the rule of Christ in the way that he demonstrates himself throughout the gospels. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so the kingdom is here now, but where? And uh, this is Luke 17. You don't have to turn there, but uh, Luke 17, 20 and 21. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's in our midst. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, what did they call the kingdom message? They called it the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Now, <clears throat> hearken back to our first couple of classes, folks, when we said that the gospel as we know it is not in the gospels. I mean, it's not spelled out anything like what we know and what we, we tend to read into certain scriptures, but it, it the way it, Jesus describes it usually, he's not describing what we understand as the saving gospel. <clears throat> but the gospel of the kingdom is here. And it is throughout the gospels. Um, okay, and did I give you some scriptures on that? Matthew 4.23, Matthew 9.35, and Mark 1.14. The gospel of the kingdom. Sorry? Sure. Matthew 4.23, <clears throat> Matthew 9.35, and Mark 1.14. You're welcome. Okay, what is the kingdom message? What is its definition? <clears throat> what can we compare it to? All right. Uh, well, I want all of you to listen to what I just said. <laughs> what is the gospel message or the kingdom message? What is its definition? More importantly, 
what can we compare it to? What can we compare it to? All right. If you got your Bibles, I want you to look up Mark 4 because this one's an important one. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4. Verse 30 and 30 through 32. This is Jesus speaking. Now listen carefully to his question that he starts this off in. Verse 30. Jesus said, and he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? Jesus himself is going to give you his definition, his meaning, his view of this, um, uh, uh, of this kingdom of God. It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that are in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. <clears throat> this is Jesus' clearest comparison picture of what he means when he's talking about the kingdom. To what do you like in this kingdom? Or to what can you compare it? It is like taking something that is the least, the smallest, the lowest. But when and after it is sown into death, then it becomes greater than all else that had appeared so great before. <clears throat> this is his understanding. Any other understanding of the kingdom, when he says, to what shall I compare it? What shall I, you know... <clears throat> That's when we need to shut down all of our other explanations and we need to just focus in on Jesus and say, Jesus, you tell me what you mean when you're talking about the kingdom. And I, and I just want to tell you, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a tremendous amount of scriptures here based on this one scripture and we're going to show that over and over and over again, when he talks, of, when the kingdom is brought up in the Gospels, it is around this area. And, and he'll say, the, the, he'll use the word kingdom, and then he'll bring up this, this um, template again and again and again. That the kingdom, as God knows it, has to do with becoming small and the least. And from that, going all the way into death, and from that, springing forth something greater than ever was great in the minds of men before. <coughs> all right. Uh, let's go to... <coughs> so sorry. Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. <coughs> Here we're going to see another one. Matthew 13 and verse uh, 44. Okay, this is Jesus speaking. How do I know? Because I have a red letter Bible. You see that? That's Jesus. <clears throat> verse 44. Again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Treasure hidden. Treasure hidden in a field, which when a man hath found it, he hideth. And for joy of it, 
goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. <clears throat> okay, so the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like hiding treasure. It's called kenosis. It's called kenosis. It is like hiding treasure. What was the kenosis? Where did we get that term from? Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> that he humbled himself and he became obedient. And he, it, it is this, he, he was, though he was in the form of God, he hid all of that. And he came down and he became fashioned as a man. <clears throat> and people were constantly, I mean, think about how many times people ask Jesus in the Gospels, well, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Are you, is, is, were you the one we're supposed to expect? Are you, are you it? And, and Jesus, you know, there's only one time that I can remember that Jesus said it, and it wasn't to people that counted. I mean, really, in that sense, that, so that he could be convincing. He intentionally hid the treasure of being God so that he could become least and small and reduced and down and down and down. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like hiding treasure, kenosis, hiding our greatness. Hiding it, not flaunting it, not using it, not capitalize on it but instead letting what is Christ be seen if honor comes at all, that it come because it's Christ in us, not because of our great talents or our great this or that or whatever. You see what I'm saying? That it's not, in other words, your goal is <clears throat> kenosis, not greatness. And you know, we've got plenty of scriptures and well, I'm sure we'll look at them, you know. We'll, uh, Master, who's greatest of all? All right. <clears throat> so a little statement here. So first there is the teaching of the kingdom. <clears throat> first there is the teaching of the kingdom. The, that's what we read already, that they went about teaching and preaching the kingdom of God, right? John the Baptist said it. Jesus said it. Jesus sent his disciples. They were doing it. So first, there is the teaching of the kingdom. This first part is Jesus teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Later, more emphasis is placed on how to live according to the kingdom. Okay. <clears throat> so, from now, for this first part of you know next bunch of classes, we're going to be looking at scriptures that are um, teaching this reality, teaching it. And then the latter part, we'll see Jesus living and being the living demonstration of the kingdom of God. All right, back to Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew 5. <clears throat> Again, we're going to read verse 3 first and then go to verse 10. <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the least. The poor, those who are poor in spirit. What, what, what have they gained by this? The kingdom. Are you starting to see an attachment here between a certain demeanor and that's what causes Jesus to bring up the word kingdom because the kingdom to him is not him coming back in the clouds and ruling over everybody. The kingdom to him is his spirit and nature being in us. And when he sees it, he said, kingdom. And that's what we're going to find over and over. <clears throat> Verse 10, blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see that? And so he goes, blessed are those who are beat down, who are, who are, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about it today. I've, I've actually thought about it a bunch over the last six months when the Holy Spirit brings to my remembrance this thing of, of the very thing 
it's so hard to, to explain. Maybe the Holy Spirit will give me grace. But this thing <clears throat> of Jesus becoming the very thing that he hated, he became sin, but it's more than sin. He became, there, there are things within his nature that are so not him. Um, for example, that for he deceiveth the people, for he takes advantage of the people. You know, they said all this kind of stuff about him, and it's not in him to do to take advantage of people or to do that or whatever. <clears throat> and so, you know, part of that persecution and part of that um, whole thing was that he was being believed to be the very thing that he hated. <clears throat> and I, I thought. If you enter into the sufferings of Christ and you enter, you happen to go into a place uh, uh, spiritually or whatever where all of a sudden you're being accused of the very things that you are not and that you, you hate, that you've stood up against, the very things that you don't, you know, you would never do and da 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 da, but, <clears throat> but people are believing that of you. How would that? change the shading of the sufferings of Christ to you? I mean, to be, uh, see, it's hard, because you, you, you have to know what you would stand up for and stand against in the Lord. And, you know, I mean, Jesus was God, and, and so before he became incarnated, you know, I mean, he saw sin, and he saw these things, and he saw people mistreating somebody, and he saw this stuff, and it, <clears throat> you know, and it was just the opposite. So he's going to come down and die to get rid of that. But part of the death is, is that he's going to have to be viewed as that very thing. That's, that's, that's hard. You know, it's one thing to just die for it because, well, you know, I'm the Savior and I'll be, you understand what I'm saying? I'm the Savior and I'll be sweet and I'll, I'll die for you, you know. It's another thing to look on the one that, that is doing that and to go, you know what? You are vile and you are this and that and you are all of this stuff. And, uh, and to realize that the very people that you're dying for are placing the worst to you on you and you're going to go out of this life with people believing that. You know, I mean, that's why the roll call at the lane of, you know, uh, the sufferings of Christ, it's usually a pretty small amount of people, you know, <clears throat> because it's, you know, it's like, no, I want to die a glorious death. You know, I want to die a glorious death. Jesus didn't die a glorious death. He was thought of as a criminal. He was thought of as a deceiver. He was thought of as... <clears throat> You know, some of the worst things. But Jesus is Jesus. And Jesus is going to bear that. And he didn't have to bear that to bear our sins. Do you understand that? that not that part. He didn't have to bear that to bear us. We put that on him. He, he said, I'll take the sin of the world. But we put all of that on him in his death and said, this is what you are and sent him out of this world in that thing. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. Are you following the spirit? Because it's, it's, it's pervasive. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. And and see, I mean, it's just it's like, okay, I will, I will believe in Jesus that He died for my sins. All right. Well, yay for you. You're so holy for doing that. You know, you dying man on a desert, and somebody offers you something to drink, and you take it. You know, oh, you're so honorable. You know. But to, to, but, but to join in on the sufferings of Christ, to do as Paul said, you know, that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, 
um, that I may be persecuted for righteousness sake but that's the kingdom that is the kingdom the, what, to what shall we liken it it is like the mustard seed that is the smallest the lowest of all seeds when it is sown I'm, I'm telling you, there's an atmosphere, a spiritual atmosphere of this that, that, you know, I'm praying that everybody will get, that you'll be able to breathe in because <clears throat> this stuff is pervasive throughout the Gospels and is always connected to the phrase, the kingdom of God, the kingdom in some way, always. And it is the exact opposite of what I would have conceived that phrase connected with Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 <clears throat> for I say unto you except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> so here the righteousness that Jesus is talking about is not a righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes that does all this display in front of people to prove that they're really special, that they're not least, that they're high, that they're special, that they're good. That's the way of the Pharisees. And Jesus is saying, look, your righteousness, unless it exceeds that. Now, here's, here's <clears throat> I've had people tell me this. Well, my God, how can, how can my righteousness ever exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? I mean, they tithed and they gave and they were always praying and they memorized the Bible and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, you, you don't even believe that, do you? <clears throat> but they did. Anyway, um, it was somebody you all know. <clears throat> anyway, uh, there... To exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is not to go higher, it's to go lower. You know, it's to go lower. I was thinking, uh, I was thinking when Deb was talking about clearing away in the seats or something like that, and I was thinking about the party, and I thought, I mean, just my mind just flashed, you know, and I thought, <clears throat> I thought, you know, the, uh, oh, she said something about, well, if visitors come in, just be, be sure and give up your chair and everything. And excuse my Randy mind, okay? But I thought, to, you know, if you want to keep your chair, just take the lowest seat. Because <laughs> they won't. Oh, no, no thanks. Yeah, uh, that's all right. I'll sit over here, you know. <clears throat> There's always a higher seat. Um, of course, that's totally out of character with the spirit of what that's all about. You do realize that, right? Okay, good. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> it's not, you know, that would be wrong. But nonetheless, the spirit of Christ, to, the spirit of Christ would take that seat and obviously even give that up if necessary because he did. Because taking the lowest seat, in my opinion, is becoming a man and then becoming in the form of a servant. But getting, giving up that seat and going to the cross, that's even the death of the cross part of Philippians 2. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> ah. um, and then uh, Matthew 6, verse 10. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When the kingdom comes, his will is done in earth. I mean, I can, you know, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How many of people pray that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, thinking, I, when the kingdom comes, his will is finally going to be done? You know, you know, that's not what they're thinking. When the kingdom come, his will will be done, and his will will be for you not to be the greatest, but to become the least. To what shall I compare it, and what shall I like in this kingdom? It is like grain of mustard seed. 
which is the least of all seeds. Matthew 7. <clears throat> Isn't it pretty cool to just go chapter after chapter and see, the, see this? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. <clears throat> Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. All right, so operating in the kingdom is to operate by a certain spirit, a selfless spirit. It is a certain spirit. It's Christ. But I'm trying to, you know, help you to see that. Um, it, and it, it doesn't necessarily involve supernatural power. It can, but it doesn't have to. If it involves supernatural power, it's for others. No, I mean, <clears throat> Jesus fed the 5,000, but when Satan said, take, you know, make stone, from these stones, make bread for yourself, he wouldn't do it. He would feed 5,000 people because that's for others. But it's the same spirit, anyway. Right. Different it's just a different angle of it. But when it came time, the devil trying to tempt him, well, what's the temptation? If he can do that and feed 5,000 people out of nothing, you know, that's no temptation, is it? It's a temptation to do it for yourself. Okay. Now, wouldn't, and I'm just saying this, and, you know, I always, I hate myself too. <clears throat> but, but isn't it, you know? I mean, if you're, isn't it the same thing if you're doing it to get glory of people? If you're, you know, you're, doing, you're feeding 5,000 whatever and you're trying to draw in something to yourself, isn't that just the same as doing a miracle for yourself? Okay. So I wrote down, entering the kingdom does not involve operating in necessarily in supernatural power, but the will of the Father to receive back his Son, which means you decrease that, he, that Christ may increase to the Father's glory. Not I, but Christ, to the glory of the Father. Remember in Philippians, that's what it said to the glory of the Father. And so um, it becomes, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> we talk about being kind of sons of God. The scripture talk about that. <clears throat> but, the, but I always, you know, and, and uh, I think Lindsay actually texted me once and asked me about this. I use the phrase that we are sons of God by Christ. That's, that little phrase is actually not specifically used in the scripture, but I use it regularly because years ago, um, <clears throat> I had been around a group of people and they were emphasizing that we're sons of God, but they weren't talking about Christ in you. They were just talking about they had become something above everybody else. And to me that, you know, I mean, I, I'm not trying to change or fix everybody or find fault with everybody, but to me it was a slap in the face of Jesus because Jesus is, I mean, the scripture says in Galatians 4, I mean, I can't, I can't argue with the scripture. The scripture says in Galatians 4 that um, uh, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child or immature, differeth nothing but a son, or nothing from a servant. But then it starts talking about, but in the fullness of time, this is coming to those that are in the family now. You have to see that setting. But in the fullness of time, God sent 
forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That sonship, we're crying, Abba, Father, but that's not us. It's, it may be our voice, but it's the, his spirit within us. We're sons of God by Christ. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be such an offense to people. To glorify Jesus. And why do we, you know, well, why do you have to add that in? Or, well, that's not in the scriptures or da 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 da. Well, it is in the scriptures. It's just not that phrase is not in the scripture, but Galatians 4 is in the scripture. <laughs> and and uh, I would, I don't want to do, I mean, how many of us would per se? I mean, I don't want to do anything that's going to take glory away from Christ. I want to give glory to Christ. Why would I want to rob him? Why would, and therefore, why would I? accept um, teachings that take Jesus out of it and make us that thing. Why would I want to accept that? And, um, and again, I don't rebel against it or whatever. I've never even, you know, I mean, I don't come down that hard. I just say to our people and people that are under my, you know, care as a, as a under shepherd, um, that let's be discerning and let's listen to the Spirit for even the slightest thing that would take away from Jesus. I mean, you know, first of all, we're robbing the Father of the Son. Then. Okay, well... I just want to talk about me, or I just want to be something, or I, I want to feel like I'm spiritual or something. I would rather feel like crap and let Jesus be everything than to lift myself up and become something that my Father has not made me. <clears throat> and so I say, I am happy with the lowest seat as long as I can sit there with Jesus in me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm totally content. I mean, I'm genuinely am. Oh, come on, brother. Wouldn't you like to have more people? Not really. They're trouble. <laughs> I'm kidding. But the, but the truth is, I am content in whatever state I find myself. And this seems to be a really good state, this state of Texas. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Maybe we got time for one more. Let's go to <clears throat> Matthew 11. <clears throat> Matthew 11 and verse 12. <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit different, I'm going to give a little different angle or meaning or angle that brings maybe a different meaning than you have thought on this verse. <clears throat> and you, you judge, you discern. Um, Matthew 11, verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. <clears throat> or maybe this is the way you've always seen it. This kingdom suffers. It's the nature of it. It, it is meant to suffer. The, how many words are there? And from that, that, that until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered. It suffers. It suffers violent. Christ crucified was a violent thing. John the Baptist's head cut off was a violent thing. It was violence in those two cases against people who absolutely did not fight back. They laid down their life. Okay? You follow that? Okay. So it's the nature of the kingdom. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying. That's what he said in every one of the scriptures we've quoted so far. Look, the nature of this thing is, what shall I compare it? Let's see, the lowest of all seeds, that when it's sown, when it's put to death, then it'll do something. That's the nature of this kingdom. <clears throat> so he's saying, look, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and you're going to suffer. And he, he said that, you know. Um, but it suffers violence, and the kingdom suffers. It suffers violence, and the violent try to take that kingdom by force. 
they use force and overrun that kingdom because that kingdom is, you know, their kingdom is a seven-headed beast that's big and huge and scary, and ours is a little helpless lamb. And they will run over the top of it every time. <clears throat> so anyway, you can consider that angle of meaning. And again, maybe that's the way you've always seen that verse, but I've, frankly, I've heard it quoted that, well, yeah, we're supposed to be of the kingdom of God and we're supposed to violently take something. That is the exact opposite, I believe, of the, and it hasn't fit everything up to this point. That's the deal, you know. It's not congruent with the way that the kingdom has been being painted in chapter after chapter up to this point. <clears throat> All right. Um, should we do one more? Uh, uh, one more. Matthew 13. I'm sort of cheating again here, so excuse me. Why? All right. Matthew 13, verse <clears throat> 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he that receives seed by the wayside. <clears throat> All right, the first thing to understand here is that the ground is not under attack, the word is the word of the kingdom. The attack is on the, the seed, right? I mean, you know the parable, right? And in every case, the attack is not against you. You say, oh, the devil's attacking me. Well, yes, but not really. He's, he's trying to get that word of the kingdom out of you or, or to keep it from catching root. <clears throat> and um, so the word of the kingdom is what's under attack. And... And the person becomes offended at persecution and hardship. Okay, and you say, well, what does that, what does that mean? Well, we're not talking about the, you know, the spread of the message. We're talking about the cross. When the cross comes, when, when there's an attack on the kingdom, because remember, they try to, you know, they try to overrun this kingdom with violence. <clears throat> and, and a lot of people give up and they go, oh, because they don't understand. They don't have the spirit of the nature of the lamb. They don't have the king ruling in them to understand, look, become the least and in your death I will raise something, uh, again, what shall I compare it? I will raise up something greater than all that was before it. So be with me in this spirit. But many times we're not with him in that spirit. We just think, well, the devil's attacking, or why is God allowing this, or someone was mean to me, or these circumstances really stink, or this and that. And we don't see the cross at all. We don't see the kingdom at all. And God's trying to sow the word of the kingdom in us. And the devil's just trying to rip it out of us and then overrun us and beat us up. And then because of the persecution and everything, we fall, we fall away. Well, I understand that. But there's some who are good ground. They're good ground. And they want this kingdom in them. And you're going you're gonna to experience stuff. You will. You'll experience stuff. And 
you know, I had a brother tell me, he said, well, why would I want to follow what you teach? Because all it leads to is persecution and people hating you and da-da-da-da, you know? And uh, I said, because it's Jesus, you know? I mean, I'm just thinking maybe just because it's Jesus, you know? You can, you can just be a Christian or you can just, you know, but I mean, I want to... I want to be one with him in his heart and in his way. I want to be conformed to his image. I want his nature to be able to come out of me. And I want more than, you know, nature coming out of me. That's great. Oh, wonderful that everybody wants that. Oh, no. How about this? I want eyes to be able to see things as he sees them so that what's coming at me is an attack on the kingdom to keep my seed from falling into the ground and died. And, and I want to see it beyond just bad people or people picking on me or circumstances turn bad or whatever and me just like in a like in a straight jacket fighting and what no is this and all this stuff i want eyes to see it the way it really is kingdom eyes and in seeing it to to be able to take it by christ by the lamb by the cross by christ crucified and go into a death with him with him in oneness in that spirit to go into a death that's going to ch finally change something in this dark selfish world it's finally going to change something so i mean my prayer wouldn't be oh you know i just want to conform to him but i can't ever discern when the cross is coming you, you understand what i'm saying i never di can discern it so all i do is fight and freak out and wrestle with everything and not understand and then you know and then it goes by and then later on maybe if i'm lucky i go hmm i wonder if that was an opportunity or not you know <laughs> and then it's it's gone you know and because it's like i'm looking for the cross but it has to look like this you know it has to you know we have an idea that it's got to be this way it's got to look this way it has to feel this way i have to feel glorious you know how about, you know, stuff sneaking up on you and Christ just comes out of you, period. You know what I mean? I mean it sneaks up on you. You don't go, ah, ah, it's the devil, get him off, and what's going on, and oh, my God, and, you know, and totally missing the whole thing. And then, you know, I rebuke you, devil, get out of my life, when, when maybe, <clears throat> maybe that attack, you could have stood your ground and you would have been good ground yes. instead of falling away because of the stuff that was happening to you. <clears throat> okay, so, so we're not talking about the spread of the message, but what naturally comes as a result of the cross. We're not, what I mean is, we're not talking about sowing seeds of the message of the kingdom. We're talking about us allowing this, the word of the kingdom to get into us so that any attack would not be seen as just persecution, but as kingdom opportunities. And from that, we're no, we're no longer the first ground. We're good ground. You see. Anyway, okay. Let me do one little thing here, and then we'll close in prayer. Well, did you have fun tonight? I just, I really think we're on to something here. <laughs> I really do. And I, you know, I've been warning you. There would be a lot of uh, <clears throat> stuff take up up to this point. But I believe that a lot of this stuff that I've been saying up to this point is going to really be like fertilizer to help these scriptures come alive for you. Father, I, I trust your leading and your guiding, and it would have been my desire to rush ahead or to, <clears throat> to try to make something more palatable. But I believe in your wisdom, and I believe that it is... Uh, Lord, the foolishness of preaching this gospel that is the power of God. And I believe that you are in it and you're on us and you're leading us into something 
that is not according to our mind or what we understand, something eternal, something Christ glorifying, uh, something that will send forth the savor of the crucified, the fires fall and instead of us screaming and get off of the altar, instead the sweet incense of Christ, the sweet savor. And Father, that sweet savor doesn't just come because we were committed Christians. That savor only came when a lamb was put on an altar and slain and lit up. That's the only time that that sweet savor rose up. And so it's not just a, a sweet lamb in the field being sweet to other lambs. It is the crucified that is that sweet savor to you. Help us to walk in that and to recognize it when it comes our way. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, we're dismissed.